I never met my dad. According to the chubby aunt next door, my dad was a scoundrel, always juggling women both at home and outside. To correct her mistake as soon as possible, my mom divorced him. When I was five, I still couldn't walk. My mom, wiping the sweat from her brow while chopping cabbages in the field, said, Walking early means a hard life. Our ancestors said, Men walking means hardship, women walking means leisure. Our Chinji is destined to live a life of leisure and luxury. Yes, at five, I was renamed Chinji. Relatives and friends all said it was an inauspicious name, but only I knew that my mom sincerely hoped I could walk swiftly, as fast as the wind, chasing rockets and racing cannons. But mom, before I can walk swiftly, I need to be able to walk at all, don't you think? My mom chopped cabbages all night. She had to take care of me, so she couldn't set up a stall in the market to sell the vegetables piecemeal. Instead, she had to sell them in bulk to a vegetable vendor. The morning market opened at 6, but to find a reliable vendor, she had to get up even earlier. By 3 in the morning, she was already awake. By 4, she had inflated the tires of the tricycle, dressed me properly, and placed two eggs in my pocket. Then, she hurriedly pedaled the tricycle onto the road. She was very thin, her back hunched. An old t-shirt hung loosely on her frame. It was still dark, and a light rain was falling. The streetlights cast a dim yellow glow. I sat in the back of the tricycle, watching her pedal. The unique smell of cabbages surrounded us. The tricycle slowly cut through the night, moving deeper into the darkness, much like my life, dim and desolate, with her as the only light piercing through the night. This scene stayed with me for many years. Whenever I closed my eyes, I saw the cold rain and the hard cabbages. When I opened them, I saw that woman's hunched back and disheveled hair, rainwater trickling down her frail spine like an ugly scar. There were 400 pounds of cabbages on the tricycle, plus my 30-something pounds. When we went uphill, that less than 100-pound woman had to stand up, hunch her back, tense her shoulder blades, grit her teeth, and pedal with all her might. I don't know how much she sweated, but on that rainy autumn day, her head steamed with white mist, as if she had aged overnight, turning into a frail skeleton. Have you ever ridden a tricycle? It looks easy to balance, but it can easily tip over when turning or going downhill. At the intersection, we did tip over. The round cabbages rolled all over the ground. She was pinned under the tricycle, but somehow, she managed to crawl out, rolling and scrambling to my side. Shout G. I was fine. She had dressed me so warmly. How could I be hurt? Her face was covered in rainwater, a cut on her forehead slowly oozing blood. She held my face, desperately wiping the rain off. It's my fault. It's my fault. You're bleeding. She was shocked, wiping my face. But the more she wiped, the more blood there was. Suddenly, I started crying. Mom, this isn't my blood. It was hers. Her hands and elbows were scraped and bleeding. She didn't even feel the pain, only fearing her son might be hurt. A cart piled high with cabbages, sold at a wholesale price of 10 cents per pound, only earned her 42 yuan. The buyer gave her 100 yuan, and she was so surprised that she frantically searched for someone to break the bill. She was not a familiar face at the market. In the cold and indifferent market, people stared blankly as this woman smiled obsequiously, nodding and bowing. In the end, she couldn't get change and humbly begged the vegetable vendor, Brother, I'll go home and get the money for you. I'll be very quick, very quick. The vendor, a middle-aged man with a bushy beard, replied, No way. What if you run off with my money? She thought about leaving the cart as collateral but realized she needed it to go home and get the money. So, she forced a smile. Brother, we're honest farmers. We won't cheat you. The vendor sneered. I don't believe you and I don't care. If you don't have change, I'll just buy from someone else. With money, I don't have to worry about finding someone to buy my produce. After much trouble, the sky began to lighten and there were only a few vegetable vendors left. If she didn't sell the cabbages soon, they would spoil by the afternoon. I clearly saw her face turn pale, and her legs almost gave out. She was about to kneel before the vendor. 
Brother, I beg you. I really have nothing else to give you. How about you come home with me to get the money? The vendor raised an eyebrow. I don't have time for that. How about this? Leave your son here, and you go get the money. The timid woman suddenly widened her eyes, filled with rage. You're worried I'll cheat you out of a hundred yuan, but aren't I worried you'll harm my son? The vendor burst into laughter, revealing a mouthful of yellow teeth, laughing until tears streamed down his face. That disabled son of yours? Only you see him as a precious treasure. Who would want him? Who would I sell him to or give him to? Who would take him? Are people raising sons or doing charity? Even raising him at home would disgust his mother, making her cry out of disgust. The surrounding crowd burst into laughter. She trembled with anger, her lips quivered, but there were no tears in her eyes, only a blood-red hue. She breathed heavily, her chest heaving violently, glaring at the vendor as if she wanted to kill him. In the next moment, without hesitation, she grabbed a vegetable knife from the basket and charged at the vendor with a roar. The crowd was stunned, as if the woman who had been begging everyone had suddenly turned into a fierce ghost. The vendor was also stunned, his face filled with terror, frozen in place as he watched the crazed woman rush at him. Fortunately, a few alert vendors grabbed her, utterly shocked at the immense strength of this frail woman. It took four or five strong men to hold her back. The crazed woman, holding the knife, pointed it at the vendor, her eyes bloodshot, breathing heavily. At that moment, everyone believed she would actually kill him. She roared, he is not disabled. Apologize to him. The vendor, finally regaining his senses, nervously and aggressively muttered, crazy woman. She bared her teeth and screamed, apologize to him. Blood still seeped from her head, her pale face filled with the resolves of a warrior facing death. Her cracked lips pressed tightly together, her whole body like a bowstring filled with murderous intent. Apologize to him. The crowd urged the vendor, just apologize. What's the point of arguing with a woman and a child? The vendor licked his lips and grudgingly muttered, sorry, okay? After hearing that, she turned to leave and the vendor, now silent, didn't dare say another word. On the way back, she faced away from me, her shoulders shaking. She didn't cry when she begged for help, nor did she cry when she pointed a knife at someone. But now, her frail shoulders heaved violently. As a young child, I didn't understand much. When the vendor called me disabled, I didn't feel much, but now, I felt sorry for her. The old tricycle creaked with her every movement. Mom, she abruptly interrupted me, her tone harsh, that uncle lied to you. Originally, I didn't believe her, but at that moment, I suddenly thought that maybe the vendor was telling the truth. At home, she rummaged through every corner, barely scraping together 58 yuan in change. Without even taking a sip of water, she lifted me onto the tricycle and pedaled furiously back to the market. She threw the 58 yuan in front of the vendor. The burly middle-aged man flinched, and she glared at him fiercely before turning and walking away without a word. As soon as we stepped outside, she smiled. In those days, a hundred yuan had considerable purchasing power, and she didn't care that 58 of it was hers. She was just happy. That banknote was blue-green, with a portrait of Mao Zedong, Zhou Enlai, Lu Xiaoqi, and Zhu Dou on the front, and Jingying Mountain on the back, its peaks lush and majestic. I'll always remember that banknote because it was fake. My mother, who had earned money, excitedly took me to buy meat. Mom will make meatballs for you and stir fry some celery with shredded pork. My Xiaoji will eat well and grow tall. The butcher had a broken bill detector. He tested it three times and each time it mechanically reported. This bill is counterfeit. This bill is counterfeit. This bill is counterfeit. My mother forced a strange smile, her voice trembling. That's impossible. How could it be? No, it can't be. We didn't buy the meat. She took me to a bank. At the counter, she shakily handed over the stained hundred yuan note. Miss, could you please check this? The young female teller took the bill and expertly examined it. With a slight motion of her red lips, she calmly said, counterfeit. Then she called out loudly for the head teller. Sister Wang, counterfeit bill for confiscation. 
My mother was stunned. Just as the head teller was about to stamp the bill with the special mark, she suddenly shouted, her voice so loud that everyone turned to look. I don't want it checked. Give me my money back, I don't want it checked. The teller shook her head blankly. According to the People's Bank of China regulations, counterfeit bills must be confiscated upon discovery. But that's my money, my money. Her voice trembled violently, barely holding back tears. Confiscating counterfeit bills is our duty. I don't want it checked. Give me my money back, please, give it back to me. She stood up, babbling incoherently, desperately banging on the glass. I was cheated. I need to find the person who tricked me. If you take the money, what will I do? The head teller, having seen many such scenes, shook her head sympathetically and prepared to stamp the bill. In the next instant, the head teller was shocked. The woman who had been begging just a moment ago suddenly knelt down, crying her heart out. I was cheated. 58 of that hundred is mine. I have no money left, not a single cent. Without money, what will Xiao Ji eat? He needs to grow tall and learn to walk quickly. How will he go to school if he doesn't walk? And if he doesn't go to school, how will he live in the future? I will die eventually. How will he live if I die? She banged her head on the floor with a loud thud. I don't want the cabbages anymore. Can I just have my 58 back? She muttered incoherently, gasping for breath, the wound on her forehead reopening, mixing blood with her tears. She wiped it away carelessly with her thick fingers. I'm not making things difficult for you. Please, just give me back my 58, just 58. The head teller's eyes reddened. She turned her head and nudged the teller, shaking her head slightly. A sealed envelope was passed through the window, with the words, Take it outside. Inside the envelope was the counterfeit bill. No stamp was placed on it. As dusk fell, my mother was ready to take me out. She stood in front of the mirror, taking several deep breaths, then solemnly looked at me with an unnatural smile. Xiao Ji, do you want some hawthorn rolls? Of course. I was delighted. Given our difficult circumstances, just having enough to eat was a blessing, and I never asked her for treats. I nodded cautiously but happily, and her eyes reddened. Let's go, mom will buy you some. Outside was a road, and ten minutes east along that road was a store, the same store where my mother often bought vinegar. I asked, puzzled, Mom, aren't we buying from Aunt Wong's place? She hesitated, stuttering slightly. We'll go a bit further, just to, um, a digestion. We walked for quite a while before a nondescript small shop appeared by the roadside. The shopkeeper was an old man in his seventies, puffing on a pipe, tapping the bowl against his shoe sole. His eyesight was poor, his beard scraggly, and he wore a shabby Zhongshan suit with the buttons tightly fastened, making his head appear large and his neck thick, resembling a catfish with bulging gills. As we approached the door, my mother hesitated, but then, as if pushed by something, she decisively stepped forward. Uncle, Hawthorne rolls, I need, um, five. She looked down at her toes, her patent leather shoes marred with scuffs. The old man slowly fumbled under the counter for a while, eventually pulling out a handful of Hawthorne rolls, placing them on the counter, and counting them with his shaky fingers, his eyes squinting into tiny slits, his fingers trembling and missing the counter repeatedly. He laughed heartily. Six, buy five, get one free. My mother almost frantically waved her hands. No, 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 that's not necessary, uncle. You run a small business, it's not easy. The old man chuckled again. No problem, ha ha, and directly handed the rolls to me. What a good little boy. My mother bowed her head almost to her chest. She slowly took out the hundred yuan note from her pocket. Sorry, I don't have, don't have any small change. No worries. The old man took the money without a glance and put it in his pocket, then squatted down behind the counter, opening a shoebox to find change. The night had just settled, and the old man was struggling to find the change. My mother stood in front of the counter, biting her lip, her toes fidgeting nervously. The old man muttered to himself as he searched, talking about what his wife had cooked for dinner, how a bullet almost blinded him when he was a soldier, the coal needed for winter, the stove needing a layer of red clay, his son falling off the roof while drying yellow daylilies and rupturing his eardrum, needing surgery come spring. 
My mother listened, her lips biting tighter and tighter, her right thumb digging into the back of her left hand, turning it blue and drawing blood. Uncle, we, we don't want it anymore. The old man looked up with a smile. Getting impatient, aren't you? All right. He placed a neat stack of small bills in front of my mother. She didn't take it, her face twitching for a moment, and then she smiled faintly. Uncle, your money box isn't closed. The old man was taken aback, looked down, and indeed it was open. He laughed heartily again and bent down to close it. Thank you, girl. My mother adjusted my clothes. Uncle, we're leaving now. The old man's face, like a catfish, was full of smiles again, and he waved happily. When we were far enough away, I asked my mother, why did you secretly put the change under grandpa's radio? Back then, she was carrying me, her protruding shoulder blades pressing uncomfortably into me. She turned her head slightly, and the evening breeze blew her hair lightly against my face. Her voice was calm yet sorrowful. We don't have to be good people, but we mustn't be bad people. Mom, do you want to be a good person? She smiled bitterly. No, but you gave grandpa the change and didn't take back the hundred you on note. For a long, long time, it was silent, with no moon or stars, but I could see the thin layer of mist in her eyes. She looked at the dark night. I don't dare to be a bad person. I'm afraid of retribution. I'm afraid, afraid my sins will come back on your legs. Mom, what if I really can't walk? She sniffed. Don't worry, I'll carry you. If someday I can't carry you anymore, I'll go ahead, be a beast of burden in the underworld, endure all the sufferings, so Xiao Ji can walk. Seven years old, and I still couldn't walk. I finally learned the name of my condition. Achondroplasia. Sounds unfamiliar, right? But if I call it dwarfism, you might suddenly understand and go, oh, what does it mean? It means I was born with short limbs and can't grow tall. And because of the excessive pressure on my lower limbs, I can't stand up and naturally, I can't walk. The worst part is that I have a bunch of surgeries waiting for me, orthopedic, decompression, shunt, anti-infection, and so on. In short, if dwarfism is a human tragedy, then I am a tragedy within a tragedy. For those years, she worked like crazy to make money, but it was always just a drop in the bucket. The story was supposed to continue like this, with the ending being nothing more than me having a short life, and finally, she would be rid of this burden, welcoming a brand new second half of her life. But she wouldn't have it. My survival was her only hope. In fact, if I had known the outcome early on, I would rather have died in childhood, ending my dependent, half-lived life. She forcibly sent me to elementary school. The principal and teachers were troubled about accepting me. She smiled and pleaded. He can't stand, but he can take care of himself. He's good with his wheelchair and won't trouble anyone. He's very smart. He can recite the digits of Pi up to a hundred places. Xiao Ji, recite for the teachers. Quickly, recite. I stared blankly at the teachers and my mother. At that moment, I felt like a monkey on display in a circus. Rebelliousness and stubbornness surged within me. I pressed my lips together and said nothing. Recite. You should recite. My mother was anxious, blushing as she urged me. I've always had a character that would rather break than bend, very much like my mother. Back then, I felt I was like Yang Guo, a chivalrous hero wandering the world, believing that heaven had a great task for me. I was at odds with the world that made things difficult for me, my solitude ancient and enduring, accompanied only by the moon, stars, and wine from millions of years ago. I simply refused to recite. My mother slapped me across the face. Recite, recite. It was the first time she had hit me, her voice choked with sobs. I didn't understand back then, but many years later, reflecting on that time, I realized that some people, despite having done nothing wrong, are toyed with by creation and punished by fate. Back then, my mother believed that even if the world was unjust, her Shaoji would always stand by her side. But she didn't expect that in her moment of utter helplessness, her son would see her as a joke. She was utterly alone. I roared. I won't recite. My mother stared at me, 
the mist in her eyes quickly forming tears. Just as they were about to fall, she suddenly turned away. Teacher, please accept him. Her voice was so sorrowful it moved everyone. That's how I started school. At that time, I wondered why she was always begging. Begging a vegetable vendor, a bank clerk, a teacher, begging the butcher for some awful, begging the vegetable seller to cut the price by two cents, begging the meter reader to record two less units, begging the garbage collector for the broken can in the trash bin. Why was she always begging? It really was disgraceful. In the second grade, I got into a fight. Well, it wasn't really a fight. A fight is a two-way thing. I was just being pinned down and thrashed. After all, I'm a cripple. Because of the pressure on my lower limbs and the constant back pain, I had a disc removal surgery. I'll never stand up for the rest of my life. But I still fought back. I smashed a tall guy named De Zhuang with an iron pencil box, leaving his head bleeding. I was pulled out of my wheelchair, my hair yanked, and beaten black and blue. The parents were quickly called in. My mother, terrified, squatted down to check my injuries. I abruptly shook her off, and she fell flat on her back. De Zhuang and his dad laughed heartily. Why were you fighting? She asked, getting up and glaring at me. At that time, she had a cheap perm, her lips painted bright red, and her overly pale foundation made her face look like a heavy mask, resembling a ghost. She wore black stockings and exaggerated red heels. De Zhuang's dad hugged his son and sneered. My son didn't say anything wrong. Why is this little cripple acting wild? My mother glared back sharply. What did you just say? Eight-year-old me actually let out a cold laugh. Aren't you going to ask what De Zhuang said? My mother's worried look turned towards me, but I turned my face away, feeling disgusted for the first time. De Zhuang had said, your mom's a prostitute. Do you understand? She sleeps with men. In that moment, I believed it, because everything started to make sense. My surgery had cost 30,000 yuan. At that time, 30,000 was an astronomical figure. She had sleepless nights, but eventually managed to pay it. Once, from the window, I saw her hugging and tussling with a man at the alley corner. I didn't understand what they were doing. When I asked her, she said the uncle was whispering secrets to her. Back then, Dragon Ball was all the rage. Having a Gohan pencil box was every boy's dream in class. As a cripple, I was the first to own one, and it was that pencil box I used to bash De Zhuang's head. That foolish woman thought that, even though her son couldn't walk, he should have the best of everything. But she didn't know that the pencil box brought De Zhuang's jealousy. He poured out all the bits and pieces he overheard about that woman to her crippled son. After that, I had nothing to say to her. I refused to go to school. She bought me the best backpack and a brand new pencil box, but I still wouldn't go. She got angry and tried to force me out in the wheelchair. I used all my strength to throw myself out of the wheelchair, fell to the ground, and knocked out a front tooth. My mother stood there like a zombie for a long while before suddenly bursting into tears. At the time, I didn't understand. It's just a tooth. What's there to cry about? She eventually transferred me to a different school, which took a lot of effort, but we didn't have the money to move. I still had to endure the whispers and pointed fingers in the streets and alleys. Women covered their mouths and whispered, then looked at me with disdain and joked about whose bastard I was. She pushed me through the long alleyways, with people undressing her with their eyes and spitting on her behind her back. One day, I snapped. Don't take me to school anymore. I can't stand the humiliation. Her eyes turned red quickly, her lips moved as if she wanted to say something, but she lowered her head. After a long while, she looked up at me. Her poorly applied makeup was a mess, a pitiful sight. She forced a smile. All right, I won't take you anymore. Be careful. From that point on, I started using my short limbs to propel my big wheelchair. By some stroke of luck, over the years, I navigated my way smoothly without any major falls or injuries. My luck seemed to improve gradually. In middle school, I participated in a prestigious citywide essay competition and won first prize. This led to a special admission to the city's top high school, where I joined the elite class and my grades remained consistently high until my senior year. 
I never asked my mother directly, but I had a feeling she had stopped those dirty businesses. She poured all her savings into a small shop in a mall. Despite her rough hands sometimes pulling threads out of the finest fabric, it didn't stop her from making the most elegant kippeos. Though I still considered her coarse, our relationship began to improve. The school was organizing a recitation competition, and our class's entry was preface to the pavilion of Prince Tung. The class advisor and the class committee searched nearly all the costume rental places in the city, but couldn't find a suitable set of costumes. The available traditional outfits either looked like they were for opera or acrobatics, making it seem like a troupe of clowns would be performing on stage. The class advisor was so anxious that his lips were covered in blisters. It was too late to change the performance piece. Around that time, there was a parent-teacher meeting, and my mother awkwardly raised her hand and licked her lips nervously. Teacher, let me try. I can make the costumes for the kids. The teacher looked at this haggard woman with half-doubt, but there was a gleam in her eyes. I can bring the costumes tomorrow. If you think they're not suitable, I can still make adjustments. This flexible suggestion was accepted by the teacher. He thanked her repeatedly, and my mother, as if startled, waved her hands frantically. No need to thank me, no need. I just have a small request. The teacher's expression changed. Just say how much money you need. My mother's face turned pale, like a child who had done something wrong. No, no, I don't want money. I just, just, just what? I just hope the parents can tell their kids privately to be friends with my son, Chinji. He's very lonely. He's not aloof. He's just, just really lonely. With that, she bent over and bowed 90 degrees. Everyone saw, with that bow, a tear quickly spread on the ground. On the day of the performance, our class's show could truly be described with one word, stunning. The scholar with his feather fan and silk kerchief, the beauty by the water, each costume was exquisite. The principal asked the class advisor if the budget had been exceeded, and the advisor laughed heartily. I, sitting in the audience, lifted my head high, never feeling so confident, confident to the point of madness. I had forgotten that my mother had spent three sleepless nights at home, straining her eyes and pricking her hands with needles, just to bring a little bit of dignity to her sensitive, aloof, fragile, and pitiful son. In this bleak and painful world, she stood in front of me, even as I attacked her again and again from behind. She not only held no grudge, but kept straightening her frail shoulders time after time. She feared that if she fell, her crippled son would have to face the endless dark nights and infinite darkness alone. On the day of the final exam, she helped me carry my wheelchair downstairs. On a sudden impulse, I opened my mouth. You, what's wrong? My mother seemed a bit delighted. Over the past several years, you could count the number of positive interactions we've had on one hand. You, you can take me to school. My mother was suddenly at a loss, stuttering, and her hands trembled unnaturally. Then, then wait for me. I'll, I'll change my clothes. Her voice was hoarse, filled with laughter and thinly veiled sobs. To my surprise, she wore a chi pao she had made herself. The elegant design highlighted the most beautiful curves of a woman's body, with vivid embroidered peonies blossoming across the front. I was 17 that year, and for the first time, I felt that this woman wasn't dirty. That year, she was in her early 40s. She was tall, dressed in a bright red chi pao, with a wooden hairpin in her hair, pushing a disabled boy who was only 1.3 meters tall through the streets and alleys to the school at the end of the road. She held her head high, her face and eyes filled with an irrepressible smile, as if she were pushing the next Stephen Hawking. The 17-year-old boy had a slight smile on his lips too. Let bygones be bygones. This long life shouldn't end in resentment and hatred. One should look forward. All of this depended on the boy not encountering that man. As we turned a corner, a man suddenly appeared and hugged my mother from behind. My mother screamed, and the man refused to let go. Of all the women I've slept with, you're the most unforgettable. The man was rat-faced and vulgar. I couldn't believe he was once one of my mother's clients. 
My mother was too frail to be a match for an adult man, and her nearly grown son was a cripple in a wheelchair, unable to offer any help. It was a downhill road. My mother cried and pleaded, trying to shake off the man's filthy hands while clinging tightly to my wheelchair, afraid I would roll down the hill. An immense rage and hatred engulfed me. I screamed hysterically. At that moment, I hated my useless legs, hated that I couldn't protect my mother, hated that I couldn't protect her, and she had to use all her strength to protect me. I pushed the wheelchair hard, and it clattered down to the bottom of the slope. My mother, like a madwoman, shoved the man aside and dashed down in her high heels. The man hesitated for three seconds before turning and running because I was already lying on the curb, blood gushing from the back of my head. Chinji. Never in my life had I heard such a heart-wrenching cry. I was still conscious, watching the woman, who was crying as if the sky had fallen, her face ashen, too afraid to touch me. I felt a pang of sadness, but when I opened my mouth, I made the biggest mistake of my life. I articulated clearly, you disgust me. My tone was filled with anger, but it sounded like sheer loathing. I was angry that I couldn't protect her, angry that I was crippled, angry at the unfairness of fate, angry that I had done nothing wrong yet was being punished so harshly, angry that I had dragged her down, making her a doormat all her life. But my anger, once spoken, turned into revulsion. This anger led me to despair, so I lashed out without restraint, hurting my mother deeply. Those who are favored always have no fear. That expression on her face haunted my dreams for years to come. Initially, they were sweet dreams of nostalgia and motherly love, but eventually, they became sleepless nights. Every time I closed my eyes, all I saw was that face, lifeless and filled with despair. In my first collection of essays, I wrote, Again and again, she opened her heart, only to be scarred each time. Again and again, I pushed her away, stabbing her in the heart. I forgot that love is accumulated, and so is indifference. I realized that the cheapest thing in the world might be selfless giving, laying everything out until you're utterly destitute, reaping nothing, achieving nothing. She finally left me. In my freshman year of college, I published my first book, a story about a young hero wandering the martial world and saving it, a character who was swift-footed and capable of scaling walls, much like another version of myself in my dreams. Initially, it was just serialized online, but to my surprise, it became a huge success. The data skyrocketed, the comments section exploded, and it dominated the trending topics. Soon, there were copyright deals, book publications, TV adaptations, and commercial operations coming one after another. I earned my first pot of gold. I was packaged as a genius writer, signing books and giving interviews everywhere, putting on a show. Beijing, Shanghai, Wuhan, Changsha. I was like a spinning top, flying here and there, with an agent and assistants. I even hired people specifically to carry my wheelchair. Whether I was disabled or not seemed to no longer matter. During that time, I hadn't spoken much to my mother for a year. After that incident, I often thought I should apologize to her, but I was selfish and cowardly and never opened my mouth. Soon after, the college entrance exams came, and I successfully avoided my mother by going to study far away, completely dodging the problem of not knowing how to start the conversation. Later, I often thought, indeed, I was selfish and cowardly, and I was also spoiled. I thought she would always stand behind me, shielding me from the wind and rain, just like in those many years, unwavering, without complaint or regret. How ridiculous. That age was absurd. I wanted to save the world, but wouldn't even wash the dishes for her once. During the winter break, I ended my busy schedule and arrived home on New Year's Eve. She wasn't there. I leisurely turned on the TV, thinking, where could she be? Probably just out buying groceries for me. The power was out at home. Only then did I realize something was wrong. The heater was cold, the food in the fridge was spoiled, and there was a thick layer of dust on the floor. She was someone who loved cleanliness, and this was impossible. I was stunned for a moment and then felt a chill in my heart. I hurriedly took out my phone, my hands trembling badly. A few seconds later, 
Her phone rang abruptly, sounding particularly eerie in the empty room. My mind went blank. In that instant, I realized that as a son, I didn't know any useful information about her other than an 11-digit phone number. I didn't even know where her shop was, who her friends were, or where she often went. No, this isn't right. I have to go out and find her. I forcefully propelled my wheelchair. At that moment, I was drenched in sweat. I thought she would always be there. The wheelchair hit the coffee table, and I was thrown to the ground. The glass on the coffee table shattered beside me, and I felt a warm liquid trickling down my face. I saw a blood-red bank book. A three-year term, maturing just as I graduated from college. 100,000 yuan. Withdrawable by certificate. Account name, Chinji. She disappeared just like that. Sometimes I think she must have found her own happiness and remarried. Other times, I imagine that my word, disgusting, was like a fishbone lodged in her throat, like a thorn in her back, and she finally had enough of me and left. Regardless of which is true, it's all my own fault. The light above me went out. I hired caregivers, but no one could tolerate my strange temper. My salary kept increasing, but in the end, I remained a lonely individual. The house was so messy that the wheelchair couldn't get through. I comforted myself, saying I'd get busy after the spring festival, and then I'd leave this place far behind. Out of sight, out of mind. I cooked for myself. The wheelchair was too low, and the oil splattered on my face. After forcing a smile for more than 10 days, I finally burst into tears one moment. Why did it hurt so much? I quickly wiped away my tears. Isn't this what you wanted? You got rid of that cheap woman who used to be with everyone. You're a talented youth with a clean background. Your mind is sharp, and you're far superior to those physically strong mediocrities. Congratulations, you're free. I wanted to bathe and change clothes, go out to have fun, drink, and be free from anyone's control. Laughing up at the sky, I thought, we are not mere weeds. I opened the wardrobe and was struck as if by lightning. The entire wardrobe was filled with neatly arranged iron suits. Each outfit was in a dust bag with a small tag attached. 18 years old, 19 years old, 20 years old, about 20 pieces, all tailored to my unique and pitiful measurements. The stitching was fine, the craftsmanship exquisite, and considering my years of sitting, the pants had extra padding at the hips, densely filled with cotton. I buried my face in the pile of clothes. I wasn't in pain. How could I be in pain? Yet my eyes felt like they were filled with sand, aching unbearably. The suits were made up to 40 years old. I thought, if nothing unexpected happens, I'll never see her again. Not all mistakes can be redeemed. Some errors are beyond repair, with no way to make amends. So I lived like this for half a year. No socializing, no work, I became a real cripple from the inside out. In July, under the blazing sun, the indoor air was cold and musty. The doorbell rang, and it felt particularly jarring. I felt like my eyes were covered with cobwebs, moving with great difficulty. I slowly turned my gaze to the door. Indeed, it was the sound of my doorbell. At that moment, I tried to stand up. I felt like a person dying of thirst seeing a fresh spring. I wanted to stand up, to open the door for her, for her. I fell to the ground. I didn't feel the pain. Every inch of my skin was straining, desperately crawling toward the door. Then, I heard the sound of a key being inserted. I barely dared to breathe. The key turned, and behind the door stood a person. A stranger. The man's surname is Chun, my father, but only by biology. He is very thin, weathered, with a dodging gaze. This is the man that foolish woman devoted her life to. He looked at me, somewhat at a loss, sitting rigidly with his legs together and hands on his knees, awkwardly rubbing them. Your mother asked me to come see you when I had time. He said hesitantly. I turned sharply, eyes bright. When? Before the spring festival. My shoulders slumped. Do you have anything else to say? He hesitated, lips trembling. I know about her past. Don't blame her. Clearly, we both understood what those things referred to. I felt drained. I don't want to hear your opinion about my relationship with her. He forced a smile. You're right. 
Over the years, I haven't fulfilled my responsibilities as a father and a husband. I've wronged you both. I was fed up. Just say what you want. Is it money? My manuscript fees aren't much, but probably enough for you to ask. Spit it out. His face suddenly turned red, and his eyes no longer shrank away. He spoke with righteous indignation. How could I ask you for money? Then why are you here today? To rekindle father-son affection? If you want to be a father to me, I don't want to be your son. Why have you turned out like this? My father was agitated, veins bulging on his forehead. You're different from other healthy children, but that doesn't justify hurting others. You complain about how unfair heaven has been to you. If you can't vent your anger on the heavens, you vent it on your loved ones. What's wrong with you? He paused, took a deep breath, and his face showed deep pain. Your mother has really had a hard time these years. I could see clearly that his eyes were red. Your mother and I were once very much in love. Later, because of you, we got divorced. Father sniffled and forced a thin smile at me. I stared at him in shock. Wasn't it about infidelity? When you were born, you had defects. Your mother and I went to every big and small hospital in the province. The final conclusion was that the child had severe osteogenesis imperfecta. Not only was he short in stature, but he was also at risk of paralysis and other diseases. Father licked his lips. I advised her that we were still young and we could have another child. Otherwise, we could quietly dispose of you. He turned to look at me, his voice drifting and weak. Xiao Ji, you should know that back then, the hospital's maternity ward trash bins often had babies who were not yet dead. He gave a wry smile, but your mother wouldn't agree. She was afraid I'd dispose of you secretly. Even before the confinement period was over, she held you all the time, never letting you out of her sight, not even when she went to the bathroom. As time passed, she saw I had no intention of disposing of you and gradually let her guard down. May I smoke? Father took out a cigarette, frowning and looking at me somewhat apologetically. I nodded numbly. On the day you turned a month old, your mother went for a checkup, and it was just the two of us left. I looked at you lying in bed. Your head was large, your limbs small, a broad forehead, and a protruding jaw. I suddenly thought that in the future, you would be a burden we could never shake off, a lifelong shackle around our necks, especially for her. So, so, I covered your face with a pillow, pressed the pillow with my hands. I thought, even if I go to hell, I can't let her live such a life. Father was burned by the cigarette and continued, but I was caught in the act. She didn't hesitate to demand a divorce. How selfish I was then. I thought, after the divorce, at least my life would be easier. During the divorce, she asked for nothing, no money, no property, just an acre of land from our hometown. Then she begged me to promise her one thing, something she never wanted you to know, that your father not only didn't want you, but wanted to suffocate you. She didn't care about the stigma of being a husband who cheated. After the divorce, I moved south. I didn't remarry, just worked and occasionally did small business. I didn't expect her to suffer so much. Had I known, I would never have left the county. Father's calm narration turned into a voice tinged with remorseful tears. She did far more for you than you know. That middle school essay competition was a turning point in your life, wasn't it? But you don't know that at that award ceremony, which was grand and attended by many city leaders, the organizers knew your situation and refused to let you go on stage to receive the award, saying it would be unsightly. Your mother went to your school every day, pleading with teachers, the head of the department, the principal, and even the organizers and the education bureau. She begged and pleaded, disregarding her own dignity, and finally, they reluctantly agreed. Do you know, before you went to middle school, she hardly ever had a full night's sleep. The doctor had once said, this child has a narrow foramen magnum, which greatly increases the risk of sudden death. Because of that, she hadn't slept soundly for over 10 years. When you were little, she held you while you slept every night, constantly watching your nostrils rise and fall. When you grew up and no longer wanted to sleep with her, she would sneak into your room every night, often checking several times. When you didn't want her to take you to school, she was heartbroken but followed you secretly, 
afraid you'd get into trouble. She only had eyes for you, getting hit by cars, twisting her ankle, stepping on uncovered sewers. She never told you any of this. And later, I know you despised her for being dirty, called her disgusting. Do you know? She tried to commit suicide because of you. We've known each other for 20 years, and I've never seen her cry. But for your one sentence, she took a fruit knife and slashed her wrists until they were bloody. But in the end, she still stubbornly called an ambulance. The doctor said, I've seen many like you who regret it when they're dying. She smiled and said she didn't regret it. She just couldn't die. What would happen to you if she did? Later, she told me that since she was willing to die for you, she was naturally willing to live for you. Xiao Ji, if there's something you care about so much, to the point of risking your life, would you be willing to exchange everything you have for it? Father suddenly asked me. I felt as if I'd been paralyzed and nodded stiffly. You are the most important thing to her. She didn't care about life or death, so how could she care about the criticism? When you needed surgery, she borrowed from everyone, sold land, sold blood. She did everything she could, and that was her only option. She called me for help. I didn't have much money either, but this beast that I am, I told her, I told you this is a bottomless pit and you're still stubborn. She hung up abruptly. How desperate she must have been, with a husband mocking her, a son scornful of her, and neighbors looking down on her. All the arrows of malice were aimed at her alone, but she still shielded you from the world's cruelty and storms. Father stubbed out his cigarette in the ashtray and stood up. Xiao Ji, no one has a smooth life. I've seen many who suffer more than you, but those who are as fortunate as you are truly rare. Ask yourself honestly, would you be willing to spend your entire life wanting nothing, doing nothing, just to stay by the side of someone who is disabled and incapable? Suddenly, I felt my face go cold. I wiped it with my hand and found it was wet with tears. Father placed a bulging envelope on the table. I'm not here to ask you for money. I came to give you some living expenses. Whether you need it or not, it's a token of my intentions. I'm not qualified to be a father, and I can't lecture you as a father, but I sincerely advise you. You think heaven is unfair to you, but is heaven fair to her? Your suffering has multiplied in her life. You haven't even experienced one ten-thousandth of her pain, who is truly unfortunate. Father turned and walked out. I suddenly broke down in tears, grasping at the last thread of hope. What about her? My mother? In fact, I was wrong from the beginning. She would never let go of me, even in death. How could she just leave without a word because of remarrying? Unless she was truly dying. In the first semester of her freshman year, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. This foolish woman was panic-stricken, but fortunately, her son was talented and already independent. She sold her shop, gathered all her savings, and worked tirelessly for two months to make more than 20 suits. During that time, she was accompanied by a segment of an interview playing repeatedly on TV, where her son spoke eloquently, smiling slightly when mentioning their family situation. I lost my parents early and lived with my aunt, who is a teacher. She smiled indifferently, fastened the buttons twice, and thought to herself, these buttons will never come off. Xiao Ji is a fool, he can't even thread a needle. She cut off water and electricity, took a tattered bag, and walked out the door. Apart from the 100,000, she had nothing left. She couldn't go to the hospital, and in a daze, she encountered a father she hadn't seen in nearly 20 years. This illness could be treated. Thank heaven. I had never been so nervous in my life. In the sweltering heat of July, the draft in the hospital corridor made me shiver. I swallowed hard, anxiously staring at the hospital room door, my palms sweaty. Summoning all my courage, I pushed the door open. She was lying with her back to me, her shoulders thin, her hair disheveled. Father said she had already undergone surgery and fortunately, it was caught in time, so the operation went very well. For the first time, I felt that heaven was not unkind to me. The room was very quiet, sunlight streamed through the window onto her face. She looked peaceful and was deep in sleep. I watched quietly, feeling like a century had passed. Mom, 
I, I heard my voice was hoarse. Facing the light, she slowly opened her eyes. Seeing me, she showed no surprise, her face blooming into a smile. Xiao Ji, dear, mommy is ill, but I'll be able to come home in a few days. I suddenly felt a wave of grievance and buried my face in her embrace. But you didn't even call me. I felt her momentary stiffness, and the next second, she placed her thin, frail hand on my head, gently stroking my hair. Neither of us spoke, but tears flowed freely from both of us. I thought, once again, there is light over my head.